Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hello and welcome to another edition of Apologetics from the Attic. This is Dave Lewis coming to you on August 4th, 2020. So today in this episode, I wanted to start a series. Um, I'm working on multiple series, juggling them back and forth, um, Justification by Faith Alone. Um, I'm working on part four of that. It's going to drop soon. And then I'm working on the Trinity, Deity of Christ. Those are two series that I want to uh, pump out. Now, I want to do this one on compatibilism. Compatibilism. And I want to start to do some content teaching on that uh, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a topic that comes up, especially when you hear about the topic of free will and you hear about Calvinism and Arminianism and you hear about these issues. Um, inevitably, the issue of compatibilism comes up. And then there was a debate recently, and I want to do a review of the opening statement of Eric Hernandez. Eric Hernandez and Derek Morrell debated the topic of free will, and you may have caught, if you're a regular listener, um, I interviewed... A debate prepped Derek last week on that. It was a good debate, uh, but I really wanted to review his opening statement, but I don't want to do that until I lay a foundation first for myself and for you of, of you know, what's wrong with the position that Eric was articulating. And so I wanted to get into this. So so our guide for this, which I've I, I want to use individuals who are much smarter than me and write much more articulately than I can to be our teacher in these matters. So in this one, we're going to look at an article called Confession of a Reformed Philosopher, Why I Am a Compatibilist About Determinism and Moral Responsibility, and this is John C. Wingard, Jr. And I looked him up. He's he's at Covenant College. He's a professor at Covenant College. And I've read this article a couple of times, and I found it very helpful. Very helpful. So it's it's a little bit dense, but I'll try to walk us through it, and uh, we can process this together and just come to an understanding of what is compatibilism, why is it important, and what does it actually mean? Because I believe it's being misrepresented by certain people who They'll just say, well, compatibilism is nothing but determinism. And it's not. That's oversimplifying it. But we'll we'll get into that as we read. So let's read. So here's the abstract, um, which is just the summary of the article. It is not fashionable among Christian philosophers today to be a compatibilist about morally significant freedom and determinism. This essay sketches a case for the reasonableness of embracing compatibilism It involves both theological and non-theological considerations. This is followed by a critique of the most widely recognized challenge to compatibilism, the consequence argument against compatibilism that attempts to show why such an argument cannot succeed. The essay concludes by noting several implications of the sort of compatibilism defended here for developing a satisfactory moral psychology. So there's the summary of what he's going to do. So he starts, I, an evangelical Christian philosopher, I'm a compatible evangelical or evangelical. Um, how do you say it? I guess it's, it's, it's if you're from Britain or United States. Okay, no, never mind. Um, I'm an evangelical Christian philosopher. I'm a compatibilist about morally significant free agency and determinism. There, I've said it. I fessed up. Compatibilism is currently not in vogue among Christian philosophers. In fact, it would not be an exaggeration, I think, to say that within the community of Christian philosophers, incompatibilism in its libertarian form is generally recognized is the generally recognized norm and I've I've noticed that too um, I, I have um, incompatibilism in its libertarian form and if you don't know what these terms mean what we'll explain he explains very well as we go through within our community especially among those who self-identify as evangelicals the libertarian view is all but taken for granted with the consequence that much of the effort these days is spent teasing out the implications of that view for any number of other philosophical and or theological issues. Even many philosophers whose roots are in the Reformed tradition and who otherwise generally align themselves with that tradition are happy to jettison the compatibilist part of the tradition and join the ranks of the libertarians. 
So a philosopher like me, who is both a Christian and a compatibilist, seems to be a bit out of step with the Christian philosophical community at large. It doesn't help that a majority of non-Christian philosophers are allegedly compatibilists of some sort or other. So why would any conscientious Christian philosopher today embrace compatibilism? And then there was a footnote here. Footnote. The conventional view that Reformed theology entails determinism and its compatibilist form has been challenged recently by, and then he gives, um, Wilhelm Van S. Oh, you know, Dr. Flowers mentioned this one. Um, uh, this Oliver Crisp deviant Calvinism broadening the Reformed, broadening Reformed theology. Um, interesting. So, okay, so let's continue. In this essay, I wish to begin to address that question by sketching my own compatibilist view of the relation between morally significant freedom, moral responsibility, and causal determinism. And something of what I, something of why I embrace it. It is not my intention in this essay to give an exhaustive treatment that interacts with all the current players in the debate or to delve into all the technical issues involved. I'll touch on some of those issues, of course, but my aim here is simply to give a general overview of compatibilism and why I hold to it. It has seemed to me that given the dominance of the libertarian position in the Christian philosophical community for some time now, it might be helpful to go back to the basics in defending the compatibilist view and that it is largely what I intend to do here. After reviewing the basic issue, I'll briefly lay out my positive and largely traditional case for compatibilism, then we'll turn to a critical consideration of what is widely regarded to be the most important challenge in compatibilism today. Finally, I'll conclude the essay by drawing a few implications of this discussion for developing a satisfactory theory of moral responsibility. Okay, so section one, the basic distinction between compatibilism and incompatibilism. Now, this part's important. And it's, you got to do a little thinking, a little deep dive. Apologetics from the attic. We want to be a place where we do some deep dives and really think through some things that maybe you're not going to hear in church or you're not going to hear on other podcasts and really try to think through some of these things. So the basic distinction between compatibilism and incompatibilism. First, let's be clear about what the problem is for which compatibilism is supposed to be the solution. The problem of freedom and determinism, as it is often called, is at bottom of the issue of whether morally significant freedom or free agency and the moral responsibility of which such freedom is supposed to be a necessary condition are compatible with causal determinism with respect to the acts of human agents. So, notice that. So, some will just simply say, well, you're compatibilist, which basically means you're a determinist. So we don't even have to get into that discussion because you're a determinist anyway. No point in having this debate with you because your position holds to a form of determinism. Therefore, you're a determinist. Well, that's, that's straw manning. That's oversimplifying. A compatibilist is saying that it's compatible that morally significant freedom or free agency, more responsibility are compatible with causal determinism with respect to the acts of human agents. So that's what compatibilism is. It's compatible to say that both are true. Now, he walks through this very well here in a minute. By morally significant freedom, I intend simply that freedom that an agent must possess to be morally responsible for any particular act he or she performs. So the question is this. Can we be free in the morally significant sense if all our acts, including our choices, are causally determined by antecedent events and or states. Compatibilists say yes. Incompatibilists say no. Okay. So then to explain this even further, he gives a syllogism, which I think this is, this is very helpful. And this is where we're going to um, dig in here. And I want to write this on the whiteboard if you're watching. I have my whiteboard up. I have my handy dandy whiteboard. Because I want to really show you, um, because it took me a couple times reading through this to, to really have it soak into wh where he was going with this. Um, but here we go. We may compare and contrast the basic positions on the problem of freedom and determinism in terms of the different attitudes people might take with respect to the following pair of claims. So I'm going to write it up here because this becomes, this becomes important when you want to um, go back and hear what he's saying. So D, okay. D 
says, all our acts, including our choices, are causally determined by antecedent events and or states of affairs. So D equals our acts are determined. Okay, causally. So our acts are causally determined. That's, that looks really bad, doesn't it? <laughs> um, our acts are causally determined. That's what D means. F, that means we human beings are free in the morally significant sense with respect to at least some of our acts, including our choices. So we are free... In morally significant sense. Okay. Incompatibilists maintain that D and F are incompatible. So that is, they affirm. So D represents determinism, F represents freedom. An incompatibilist says it's impossible. It's impossible for D and F to be true at the same time. Note that the incompatibilist is claiming that D and F are contraries, not contradictories. That is, it can't be that both D and F are true, but it might be that both are false. In other words, from I, it does not follow necessarily that D and F have to be opposite truth values so that it has to be the case that one of the two propositions is true and the other is false. All this being claimed by the incompatibilist is that the conjunction of D and F cannot be true. So in other words, D could be true and F untrue. F could be true and D untrue. So an incompatibilist, so for example, many incompatibilists that I talk to, Dr. Leighton Flowers and the provisionist, for example, um, they would say F is true and D is untrue. Because F is true, D is untrue. So we, we our, our actions are free in a morally significant sense, and that excludes that anything could be causally determined. Although they kind of waffle on that a little bit and say, well, some things are causally determined. Certain things are causally determined, but not everything's causally determined, which, which I'm still trying to work out how you can be consistent across the board with that. Um, and, you know, if we're going to, you know, um, get in the ring and, you know, I'm going to start calling people incompatibilists and just label them that. So you're a indeterminist, theistic incompatibilist because we're called... Um, you know, exhaustive divine determinist, you're an inexhaustive divine indeterminist, you know, for example, because this is, you know, this is what, this is what we do. This is the, the apologetic ring. So, you know, let's label, if you want to label Calvinists exhaustive divine determinist, then I suppose the other position is in inexhaustive divine indeterminism. Well, no, God determines some things. Well, there's where your uh, consistency is falling apart. But anyway, there are various kinds of incompatibilists. So remember, what's an incompatibilist? An incompatibilist uh, holds to I. It is pos impossible for D and F to be true at the exact same time. So D means that acts are causally determined. F means there's, our, our actions are free in, in a morally significant sense. It's impossible for both of those statements to be true at the same time. That's the incompatibilist position. So there are various kinds of incompatibles, he says, but the most prominent kinds and the ones who are most relevant to this essay are libertarians and determinists. So this is, a, this is a very important point to get. Determinists are also incompatibilists. So it is not correct to call a compatibilist a determinist. Are we seeing that? It is not correct to call a compatibilist a determinist, which is done over and over and over again. Well, no, you're a compatibilist. You're just basically a determinist, so we don't need to, uh, to deal with you. That's not the case, okay? Determinism is actually a form of incompatibilism, and he explains. So libertarians are those who, in addition to accepting I, take F to be true. So back, look at the whiteboard if you're watching. Remember what I means is it is impossible for both 
determinism and freedom to be true at the same time. Okay? So libertarians say that I is true, but F is also true. So we are free in a morally significant sense. Okay? Since in determinism, the denial of D is entailed by the truth of the conjunction of I and F, libertarians are indeterminists. So in other words, they hold to I and F, but they reject D. Okay? They are indeterminists because they reject determinism. On the other hand, incompatibilists who take D to be true are determinists, sometimes called hard determinists. Determinists of this sort are logically forced to deny F, the thesis that we have morally significant freedom because of their commitment to both the determinist thesis and the incompatibilist thesis. Okay, so interesting. Determinists hold to I, but they reject F and accept D. So in, determinists say it's impossible for both determinism and freedom to be true at the same time. Therefore, we uphold determinism. Why are compatibilists not determinists? Because we don't hold to that. Okay? Determinists logically deny F. We do not. So it's inaccurate and it's misrepresentation to say that a compatibilist is merely a determinist. Now, you can claim that we're wrong. You can claim you're illo we're illogical. But please say that no, determinists are actually incompatibilists as well. That would be more accurate. Determinists are incompatibilists also. I actually, if I'm a libertarian, I actually am the same as a determinist in the sense of, I do not find these statements compatible. So we're both incompatibilists. So interesting, right? Contrary to incompatibilists of either the libertarian or deterministic stripes, or other stripes for that matter, compatibilists hold that D and F are compatible. They affirm the following proposition. So we have to add a new proposition to, the, to our board here, which is C for compatibilism. It's possible for both D and F both D and F are true at the same time. That's what makes us a compatibilist, okay? We're not determinists. We're compatibilists. Incompatibilists are both libertarians and determinists. Compatibilists say it's possible for acts to be causally determined, yet they're free morally in a morally significant sense. So he continues, obviously, C is the contradictory of I. It is impossible for C and I to have the same truth value. Necessarily, one is true and the other is false. So he just made the distinction that D and F are not necessarily contradictories. They're contraries, but they're not logically contradictory. Okay, so that's why, you know, one is true and the other is not in C is contradictory to I. It is impossible for, so I says it's impossible for D and F to be true. Uh, C says both D and F are true. Obviously those are contradictory. So one is true and the other is not. Okay. Everyone, I hope everyone's following along so far. This took me a couple times. Um, I'll put this article in the show notes and in the podcast uh, notes and you can read it yourself and study it. But this is, this is pretty important foundation just to understand the difference between compatibilism and incompatibilism. Okay. Um, so C and I obviously cannot be true at the same time. Okay. We are claiming that D and F can be true at the same time. But the incompatibilist says either F or D is true. Both cannot be. But remember, what's interesting, again, I want to emphasize this again. Both determinism and libertarianism are incompatibilist positions, okay? A determinist and a libertarian actually share a commitment to incompatibilism because they say D and F are incompatible. We are compatibilists. We argue that D and F are compatible. Determinism and morally significant freedom are actually true at the same time. Okay, he continues. A further distinction is sometimes drawn here. The simple compatibilist is only committed to the truth of C, 
But some compatibilists are committed not only to the truth of C, but to the truth of D and F as well. Call compatibilists who affirm C, D, and F substantive compatibilists to distinguish them from simple compatibilists who might deny either D or F or both. My own view is a version of substantive compatibilism. I haven't really looked into that distinction. See, this even gets even deeper, man. You can get into the next distinction. Well, you have a distinction in types of compatibilism. You have substantive compatibilists and you have simple compatibilists. Um, okay. There are other views in the four so far enumerated, of course. But for the purpose of this essay, this will suffice. Before proceeding, I should make one more comment about my formulations of I and C above. I have used the words impossible and possible without qualification in these formulations. One might wonder precisely what sort of modality, possibility, or impossibility I have in mind. So you remember, what does I mean? I means it's impossible for both um, acts being causally determined and, and choices being morally free and significant. Um, and then C is both determinism and freedom are possible. Actually, you know what? I wrote that wrong because, well, no, he's, well, yeah, it's possible for both D and F to be true. So, and he's, so let me write that here because he's saying that's an important word that he wants to um, comment on. Um, so where, where was it? Um, okay, let me begin by saying what is not intended by possible and impossible. I take it that the issue here is not whether the conjunction D and F is epistemically possible, i.e. possible so far as we know or so far as we can tell, nor is the issue that of whether the conjunction of D and F is causally or physically or not uh, nomologically possible. See, these are some terms I just need to study more. I'll be honest with you. Nom nomological, I don't know what that word means. Physically or nomologically possible. That is, the issue is not whether, given the natural laws of our particular space-time universe, it's possible for both D and F to be true. It seems clear that the issue between compatibilists and incompatibilists is either one of metaphysical possibility or logical possibility. If the issue concerns metaphysical possibility, we can usefully think of it in terms of possible worlds. The question in that case is whether there are any possible worlds in which both D and F are true. Their conjunction is metaphysically possible if and only if there are some such possible worlds, whether or not the actual world is one of them. The question of logical or conceptual possibility, on the other hand, is whether the conjunction D of D and F constitutes or entails a contradiction. That conjunction is logically possible if and only if neither constitutes nor entails a contradiction. Now, logical possibility is more extensive than metaphysical possibility. That is, anything that is metaphysically possible is ipso facto logically possible. Conversely, logical impossibility entails met metaphysical impossibility. The entailment does not go the other way, however, from the fact that something is logically or conceptually possible, i.e. is not self-contradictory, it does not follow necessarily that it is, metaphysically it is metaphysically possible, nor does metaphysical impossibility strictly entail logical impossibility. We need to do more than distinguish these kinds of modality here. The sort of compatibilism that I am interested in takes it that the conjunction of D and F is metaphysically possible, hence logically possible. In other words, the version of central, the central compatibilist, compatibilist thesis that I embrace is one that involves more than merely saying that the conjunction of D and F does not violate the law of non-contradiction. Okay, so metaphysical possibilities here versus logical possibilities. Um, and he explains that. I can't sit here and claim to you that I can totally break that down for you because, like I said, I, I'm not a trained philosopher. Um, but he's basically saying that if you can prove something is metaphysically possible, then it becomes logically possible uh, ipso facto. But we'll, well, you know, okay. So um, he, th here's a little bit of paragraph here. And then I want to get into the theological reasons for compatibilism because that's the part of this article I like the most um, just checking my time here okay why I'm a compatibilist why think that compatibilism is true I'm a compatibilist for a variety, variety of reasons in this section I wish to rehearse briefly some of those reasons again my aim is not to offer as exhaustive or rigorous a treatment as possible my aim here is simply to give the reader some idea of why I am convinced that compatibilism is true and reasonable to accept or believe. Before proceeding, it may, might be helpful to say a little something about my own more general metaphysical and epistemological commitments. My methodological orientation as a philosopher is generally that of the Scottish common sense school of philosophy, 
While my view of the relation between morally significant freedom and causal determinism differs from that of many common sense philosophers, for example, that of Thomas Reed, the father of the Scottish common sense school, nevertheless, I think that this general approach to doing philosophy is superior to the alternatives. So this is giving you a lot to research, isn't it? The, the Scottish common sense school of philosophy, and, and what's that mean? Even more significant to my own reasons for accepting compatibilism is the fact that I am a thoroughgoing theist and an evangelical Christian. So here's where here's where we get into some meat of, uh, you know, this is a philosophical topic, but we we get he he gives his reasons from his Christian commitment to being an evangelical. I believe that God, as traditionally understood in Christian theism, exists, and that He has spoken both in the Book of Nature or general revelation and in Scripture, special revelation. My belief about Scripture is especially significant for my inquiry. I embrace the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as not only humanly authored, but also divinely authored or God-breathed. One particularly significant implication of this view of scripture, of course, is that it has special authority not possessed by any writings that are pro the products of merely human authorship. Indeed, because it is God's revelation, it is absolutely authoritative for our thinking and conduct. That is, its normativity with respect to belief and conduct is such as to be non-overridable. Nothing can trump the authority of scripture. Thus, informing my own views about freedom and determinism, I take scripture to be normative in whatever it says that is relevant to our theorizing. In what follows, though I shall not go into much detail, it will be evident that the data of scripture, as I understand it, and traditional Christian doctrines that are derived from or based on scripture, crucially shape my thinking. So that's a huge paragraph, that the scripture is non-overridable, nothing can trump it, it is... It norms our thinking and conduct, and especially in this issue. And just because it's on my mind, um, Eric Hernandez's opening statement, I found the part of it that was shocking to me is he, he barely mentioned any scripture, and he basically said he doesn't need scripture. He, I mean, he straight up said it. When we, I'm, not, I'm not misrepresenting him. He basically said he doesn't need to quote scripture to prove his point. He doesn't need to. And then he further went on to say, you basically can't even, now I'm still trying to, I don't know what he meant by this, but he basically, I, it, it was almost to me like he said, you, unless you're a libertarian and believe in libertarian free will, you can't even understand the Bible. You might as well not even try to understand the Bible. There, uh, the overriding presupposition is man must be autonomous in a morally free sense and nothing can be determined. And until that's true, until you accept that presupposition, you pretty much can't even understand the Bible. You can't argue for anything else. You have to, you know, it's, 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 some of it's like, actually, like, I'm like, dude, like, pump the brakes. Like, this is becoming man-centered to a, a, a scary extreme. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll review that. I'll try to be fair with it. It's just, I'm, I've listened to it a couple of times now, and I'm just like, man, this is this, this opening statement's really just like, uh, man is the center and measure of all things, and God's kind of just up in heaven, gave us a bunch of free choices and hopes that we use them correctly. I mean, um, so why am I a compatibilist? I am a compatibilist for both theological and non-theological, merely philosophical reasons, and what follows, I shall offer some reasons of each kind. Okay, so here's what I want to cover in the remainder of the episode here, the theological reasons for compatibilism. Okay. I'll begin with some of the theological reasons that motivate my acceptance of compatibilism. In general, it seems to me that compatibilism comports better with traditional Christian doctrines than does incompatibilism. For example, I think that compatibilism is logically compatible with the robust doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty, including strong, strong doctrines of divine foreordination and providence, while incompatibilism is not and um, when you listen to the debates when you hear the discussions um, yeah I mean you know w the incompatibilist the the libertarian incompatibilist you know I just I reject that God foreordains things I reject his providence and that's something that really is not you know the providence of God meaning his active upholding of creation itself his active upholding of the laws of nature um, in which he, he, he didn't just wind up the clock and let things run. 
I mean, I've said this before, and I, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying that they would ever claim this, but it seems like it moves toward deism. That in their view, God created heavens and earth, and then free will is kind of like, in a deistic sense, this law that now operates perpetually on its own apart from the providence of God. Um, I should do an episode where I try to tease that out, but I really think that that's where it leads and that's where it's headed toward. It's a deistic closed system. Um, but his point there is um, compatibilism is a robust doctrine or it's a compatible with this robust doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty, meaning his divine providence and his divine foreordination. The witness of scripture throughout seems to be that a God has from eternity foreordained and throughout history ha and continues to providentially govern in an active, not passive way, everything that occurs. Not just some things, but everything, including the acts of human beings, and at the same time, that human beings are quite often morally responsible for their actions. Okay, so we are compatibilists. I am a compatibilist because I'm driven to it by the teaching of Scripture. And I agree with this statement. Scripture teaches throughout. That, and in this series, we're going to dig into this more and more. So this is just an overview. But we will go over the Scriptures um, exegetically, verse by verse, and take the time to dig into Scripture and show all the Scriptures that teach that God has from eternity foreordained and throughout history has and continues to prevent providentially govern in an active, not passive way, everything that occurs. Not just some things, but everything, including the acts of human beings at the same time that human beings are quite often morally responsible for their acts. Okay, now, now number, he's got a footnote. Let's see what the footnote says. My view is often referred to as the doctrine of meticulous providence. And yeah, you'll hear that. You'll hear that said. Um, by the way, it is because of this latter point, i.e. that scripture clearly indicates that human beings have, bear real moral responsibility, that I have no truck with theological versions of incompatibilistic determinism such as hyper-Calvinism. Any view that does not recognize human beings to be morally free and responsible agents is simply inconsistent with the claims of scripture. With respect to theological categories, I am a Calvinist, not a hyper-Calvinist. So remember, and it's, it, is, it is interesting to think through this because I never really thought about it this way until recently. Um, hyper-Calvinists are also incompatibilists. Now, they're determinists, okay? Um, but they're incompatibilists. So there's incompatibilistic determinism, and then there's Ill incompatibilistic libertarianism, okay? Provisionists are incompatibilistic libertarians, and hyper-Calvinists are incompatibilistic determinists. We are compatibilists. Now, you can accuse us of being determinists. You can try to make arguments that say, well, you're claiming that F is true, but because you hold to D, therefore F is not true. You, you, it's impossible for D and F to be true at the same time. That's okay. That's fine. You can make that argument, but don't mislead people and say compatibilists are merely determinists. I've heard it said way too many times. Well, compatibilists are just determinists. And without even making the argument for how you come to that conclusion. It's more accurate to say, well, no, compatibilists believe and claim that both D and F, it's possible for them to be true. It's logically possible for acts to be causally determined and there to be free and morally significant decisions. They, now, I disagree, but that's what compatibilism claims. Don't claim compatibilism is merely a form of determinism. It's not. So I, if you get nothing out of that, um, please, my provisionist friends, that, that's, stop saying that. Okay, it, it, Be honest about it and say, well, no, compatibilists say that determinism and morally free choices are true at the same time. That's their claim. Now, I dis, I, I, I refute their claim and I disagree with their claim, but I'm not going to say, because I've heard it said, well, compatibilists are just determinists. No. No, that's not the case. Okay. So, and I also reject hyper-Calvinism because it is incompatibilistic determinism, and I reject incompatibilistic determinism, okay? Um, now, but even if one balks the claim that God is foreordained and providentially controls everything that comes to pass in this world, surely one should admit that Scripture seems to record some specific instances of human choices and actions that God foreordained and was actively engaged in bringing about, 
and for which the relevant human agents were nevertheless morally responsible. Because and he goes to the classic clobber passages, um, which I still have not got a satisfactory exegesis from Arminians or provisionists. I just haven't. Consider just one particularly notable example, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In the record of Peter's sermon at Pentecost in Acts 2, we find Peter saying the following about Jesus' crucifixion. Acts 2.23 says, This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on a cross. Do you see that? How both are present in that text? Why was Jesus handed over? Because it was by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. This is the NIV. Which, you know, I like the NIV. I mean, I have an NI, old NIV version that is one of my, you know, it's because I had it when I first came to Christ almost 20 years ago. And I want to get it rebound by that guy James White always talks about, but it's kind of pricey. But I, I want to invest the money to get that thing rebound because the binding's falling apart. And it's my, you know, everyone has that one Bible, right, that you had from when you first became a Christian. Um, here's the ESV. Here's a, how the ESV reads with that. Um, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So you see both there. There's D, determinism. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God determined um, to, is that um, his definite plan and foreknowledge? And by the way, um, just in passing, that's a Granville Sharp construction. Um, I could pull out, um, what's that guy's name? Uh, the w W West West W the, he, he's got the word study book. He, he, got, he has a lengthy article about, um, how set purpose and foreknowledge are actually synonyms. Um, and it's interesting because that, that eliminates the idea that sometimes is read into a passage like this. Well, God's foreknowledge, he just saw it would happen. And because he saw it would happen, then he purposed it. And that's not what it means. Um, purpose and foreknowledge are the same. Um, so he was handed over. Why? Because God's purposed it. But wicked men put him to death. And then, of course, Acts 4. So we have Acts 4, 27 and 28. Very important passage. Acts 4, 27 and 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So, I don't know how you can get much more clear. This seems very clear to me. That you have the human actors, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles and the people of Israel, they did... Whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So human actions that were divinely determined by God's predestination and his plan and his hand. And Calvin gets real deep into the word hand. Why did the Holy Spirit put the word hand in there? And not just a general plan. It's God's hand. He's meticulously involved in bringing about that event because he determined it and i've had i've had discussions over the years with people who are staunch wesleyans arminians who will say well okay he did it does seem that god sovereignly determined from in like sounding like a calvinist the crucifixion okay so i mean <laughs> there's there's a lot of people who will be like well you know i could i could say god's left the universe up to you know autonomous free will and libertarian free will uh, a whole bunch, but you know, the, the crucifixion, yeah, clearly that was planned. <laughs> um, these early Christians seem to be thinking of Jesus's crucifixion as both something that was planned, hence determined by God himself and something for which the humans involved are morally blameworthy. This idea that Jesus's crucifixion was the result of both the foreordination and providence of God on the one hand and the sinful actions of men on the other hand certainly squares with the witness of the four New Testament gospel accounts and indeed the rest of Scripture. Note that even this one instant alone, instance alone is enough to show that significant moral agency is compatible with determinism. Let me read that sentence again. Because you'll, you'll well, well, okay, well, God determines some things. Well, isn't that a pretty 
big concession? If you're having a debate with a indeterminist, libertarian indeterminist? Well, God, okay, he determines some things. Well, okay, so what are you saying? So, okay, so you do, but see, doesn't that, because an indeterminist says it's impossible for D and F to both be true. So if you're going to, so back to the syllogism, right? I mean, that's the end of the debate. That really is the end of the debate. Because if you look back, if it, uh, an indeterminist says it's impossible for DNF to be true at the same time, if you're going to claim, well, in that case, there are acts that are causally determined, then you just denied F. You just denied it. Okay? So your indeterminism forces you to become a determinist. In other words, you're saying, well, okay, that in that case. So that's why... You know, when it comes to this issue, you won't get a clear answer. And so when we when we review Eric Hernandez's opening statement, I got a few questions in, and you'll see it comes up on YouTube as Apologetics from the Attic. And I asked about Acts 428, and we'll look at Eric's answer to it. It it wasn't it wasn't a, it was like a non-answer. It was like a not, he, he mentioned Molinism or something. It was not, a, I, I didn't find it a very, you know, satisfactory answer for It was just like a non-committal, like, well, you know, I, I, that could be Molinism, that could be this. And that's one thing about the provisionist camp that really, you know, drives me crazy. I love these guys, man. I mean, go, I go on, I've been on Layton's program three times now. I love the guy. We got uh, me and Kevlar Kadot. Uh, we're, we're buddies. We're becoming buddies online. And these new guys that run the, what's called the provisionist perspective, they, they are cool guys, but like, man, um, you know, sorry that we Calvinists are the only ones that have to be consistent on this topic where the provisionist can be an open theist. You can be eternal. Now you can be simple foreknowledge. You can be Molinist and you can kind of be noncommittal on this stuff. But anyway, Acts this th that text and acts and there are more texts okay so that's gonna be another episode we're gonna walk through other texts that clearly teach compatibilism okay in, in my opinion but we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll go with this one right now okay notice that even this one instance alone is enough to show that significant moral agency is compatible with determinism there are other instances of this coupling in scripture as well Joseph in the story, uh, Genesis 37 to 50. So we'll have to look at that one. The account of Pharaoh's heart and heart in Exodus 7 to 14, etc. Any one of which is sufficient to establish the truth of the compatibilist central claim. And with that, simple compatibilism. That in itself is an exceedingly significant point. For if there is even one instance of morally significant human action that is causally determined, then the rug is, pu the rug is pulled out from under incompatibilism. Now, I would be curious how someone would argue against that point. Let me read that again. It is in itself, in itself a exceedingly significant point. For if there is even one instance of morally significant human action that is causally determined, then the rug is pulled out from under incompatibilism. Okay? So, and here's another, here's a couple important points here. Furthermore, Compatibilism is clearly consistent with the traditional doctrine of divine omniscience, or more particularly, the doctrine of divine foreknowledge, whereas incompatibilism in its libertarian form is not, or so it seems to me at any rate. According to the traditional doctrine, God knows all things, including the morally significant acts of human agents before they occur. Such knowledge entails that there is a truth of the matter about what any agent does before he or she does it. And that in turn entails that the act is predetermined. I've been trying to say this over and over again. Thank you, sir, for articulating it in a way much more sophisticated than I ever could. The problem is that any, the classical, traditional doctrine of divine foreknowledge, okay, is denied in its liberty with libertarian incompatibilism is forced to deny 
the traditional doctrine that God knows all things, including the morally significant acts of human agents before they occur. Okay? Why? Because if God has that knowledge that he knows a morally significant act before it occurs, then he knows the truth value. He knows what's going to happen. He has the knowledge. This, this is going to happen. And that makes it automatically predetermined. Now, what's the only way around that? Well, he tells us the only way around that. It seems to me that there's an inherent instability in the combination of libertarianism about morally significant freedom and traditional Christian theism. And by the way, that's something you need to study. Um, classical theism versus theistic personalism. Okay, Google that. Classical theism versus theistic personalism. And listen to what guys like that have to say. Read All That Is In God by James Dolzell. Dolzell? Um, the book is over there, but it's called All That Is In God. If you Google that book, All That Is In God. Um, and he, he made an appearance on Christ the Center and Reform Forum. Um, All That Is In God. In interesting stuff where um, they would argue that there's a movement to basically make God like us and reject the classical theistic attributes of God that were have been present all through church history. And certainly in the Reformation, if you want to call yourself Reformed. Okay, so let me, let me start this paragraph over again, because this is a very important paragraph to me. It seems to me that there's an inher inherent instability in the combination of libertarianism about morally significant freedom and the traditional Christian theism. Well, I shall refrain from developing and defending this claim here. Suffice it to say that it seems to me that theistic libertarians ultimately face a dilemma of either giving up their incompatibilism, which I wish they would do, or displacing the traditional doctrine of God's omniscience with a thinner doctrine of God's foreknowledge, one that does not affirm that God knows absolutely everything before it exists or occurs. Even if that is not the case, however, it certainly seems on the face of it that the compatibilist view, at very least, fits more readily with the traditional Christian doctrine of God's omniscience, according to which God foreknows even the future contingent acts of human agents than does the incompatibilist view. And you see this, for example, in the provisionist movement. They do displace the traditional doctrine of God's omniscience with a thinner doctrine of God's foreknowledge, whatever that looks like. Molinism, open theism, they, they, uh, they, they start to, to tip, dip their big toe in some of these other, and I like how he describes it, thinner doctrine of God's foreknowledge. Whereas a classical Arminian is not going to do that. A classical Arminian um, is going to say, no, God has perfect, absolute foreknowledge of all future events. Um, compatibilism also seems to me to square better with a traditional Christian anthropology. So this is this is important too, because certain views will will their their anthropology is is you know the denial of original sin um, gets a little bit dicey to me in some of these incompatibilist libertarian views. Um, the biblical portrait of human nature over the span of redemptive history seems to me clearly to favor a compatibilist view, as theologians have noted through the centuries. Scripture seems to indicate that the fall in sin brought about a significant change in our agency, specifically with respect to our ability to obey or disobey God. Whereas before the fall, human beings were able to either sin or to refrain from sinning. Now, this is the classic Augustinian um, passe non pecare, non passe non pecare. Um, you know, go back and listen to. And by the way, if you just want the most basic, straightforward overview. If this is a little too complicated for you and you're not here yet, you're like, Dave, you're not making sense. Go check out Ligonier Ministries, R.C. Sproul, Willing to Believe. He has uh, uh, a series, video series, where he teaches. It's called Willing to Believe. A lot more basic than I'm even being. R.C. walks you through these issues in a very, very good way, as only R.C. can with his very you know, clear communication and his style of communicating. Um, I wrote that series to me is, is, is necessary to um, have a foundation to engage on what we're talking about here. So if you're feeling like, man, I'm still not getting what you're saying, go back and listen to RC, willing to believe.
Um, whereas before the fall, human beings were able to either sin or to refrain from sinning. After the fall, we were unable to avoid sinning. In our fallenness, we are dead to God and to true righteousness. By God's grace, redemption brings about another major change in those of us who are redeemed that significantly affects our agency. Regeneration renders the agent alive to God and true righteousness, hence able to not sin. Hence, able not to sin. So that's, <laughs> it's a distinction in the Reformed. There's a difference between being able not to sin and not able to sin. There's a difference. Okay. We won't get into that here, but that, that's, that's, that's why that, it sounds weird, right? Able not to sin, but there's being able not to sin and not able to sin. Moreover, I think that Scripture supports the claim that those who are regenerate are ultimately incapable of falling away from God again. Finally, in a future event that evangelical and reformed theologians call glorification, the regenerate will be confirmed in righteousness. That is, we who are through faith united to Christ will be made personally fully holy and impeccable, incapable of sinning by God in his grace. This is part of the Christian's eschatological hope, future hope. We look forward to being forever completely free from sin, not just its penalty, but also its pollution and power. Indeed, we eagerly look forward to being perfectly virtuous and unable to sin. In other words, we look forward to being morally perfect, free agents, confirmed in personal righteousness that can never be lost. My point here is simply that compatibilism seems to accord quite well with the biblical data concerning human nature, while well, incompatibilism does not. The incompatibilist, to be consistent, must take the effects of the fall and redemption on human nature to be less radical than what I've suggested above, which, which they do, which they do. It's, I mean, it's a big topic that you can get into, well, original sin. Well, Augustinian is, Augustine is wrong. He was, he was influenced by Manichaeanism. And this whole idea of original sin started with Augustine, which is wrong, which is wrong. Okay, I did an episode on that. Um, I need to get back into Warren, but brother Warren McGrew is doing, he's up to five parts now, and I've only reviewed part one where he's, done, I mean, he's, I mean, I don't want to, this, it's like name calling, you're not allowed to call people this, but he's basically a modern day Pelagian. I mean, he, he, he takes it further than the provisionists ever would in denying original sin. Um, but they, 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 uh, it's, the incompatibilist to be consistent must take the effects of the fall and redemption on human nature to be less radical than I've suggested above, which I take to be the teaching of Scripture. In our fallenness, we must still be able to avoid sinning according to the incompatibilist. Christians, the regenerate, must be capable of rejecting God and returning to the state of fallenness and sin as they were prior to regeneration. This is important too, and I haven't heard them address this point. Even in the new heaven and new earth, Christians must still really be able to sin if incompatibilism is true, and if we are still to be morally responsible beings, that is, incompatibilism seems to entail that impeccability is utterly impossible for us, even in the life to come after the resurrection, if we are to continue to exist as moral agents. The alternative to denying the eschatological impeccability of Christians for the non for the incompatibilist who believes in the afterlife, Christians would be, would, let me read that sentence again, sorry, okay, slow down. The alternative to denying the eschatological impeccability of Christians for the incompatibilist who believes in an afterlife for Christians would be to concede that we who are Christians will be transformed so that we can never again sin but along with that deny that we are moral agents from the moment we lose the real possibility of sinning in other words the price of accepting impeccability for the incompatibilist is that we lose our status as moral agents on that alternative not only can we no longer be morally vicious we can no longer be morally virtuous either Neither the denial of impeccability for Christians in the afterlife nor the denial of morally significant freedom for Christians in the afterlife seems to me to square with the witness of Scripture. Basically, if, if F in your system is, you know, okay, well, it's, you know, it, for, for us to exist as more free moral agents, we have to always be able to sin. We have to always be able to either choose God or not choose God. That must also be true when we're glorified. Is basically what he said in that paragraph. And John Frame, I'll pull that out for another episode. Um, he has a good way to argue this as well. That um, you know, we, we 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 if you push this to so far, then yeah, you have to be able to sin in heaven. You have to be able to sin in the new heavens and new earth, because you wouldn't be morally free. You wouldn't be morally free. There are other traditional Christian doctrines that the impeccability of Jesus Christ in his earthly life, for example, 
that are consistent with the compatibilism but not with incompatibilism, or at the very least seem to me to fit much better with compatibilism than incompatibilism. Um, I, I'd love to hear that argument. Um, but anyway, however, I trust that I have offered enough already to indicate something in the way of the way of which I would contend that compatibilism is more reasonable to accept than incompatibilism on specifically theological or biblical grounds. It is time to turn to some of the more generally philosophical, non-theological reasons for my acceptance of compatibilism. Now, I want to try to work through this, but to be honest with you, it's tough for me to work through. So I'll be the first to admit that philosophy is not my forte, and if philosophy is your forte, check this guy out and check out what he's doing. So I'm, I'm reading this and studying this. So, um, you know, in the next episode of this series on compatibilism, we, we may go through some of this. Uh, we may jump to some other things. I definitely want to use this as a foundation to critique Eric Hernandez's opening statement in, in the debate on free will and review a couple of how he answered a couple of my questions that came up in the side chat that was put on the screen. Uh, but I hope that this has been helpful to you, um, that you have been helped by this uh, compatibilism, just an overview, what is compatibilism, and it's helped you to think through the issues. And one statement I want to, to, to pound one more time. Remember, compatibilists are not determinists. Okay? Incompatibilists can be both libertarians and determinists. So hyper-Calvinists are determinists of the incompatibilist type. It's interesting, right? You, you know, I've never heard it put that way, but it's true. Hyper-Calvinists are incompatibilistic determinists libertarians are incompatibilistic indeterminists okay so they're both incompatibilists in other words so the hyper calvinist and the libertarian are both incompatibilists we are compatibilists don't oversimplify and straw man it and say well compatibilists are just determinists that they're just they're, they're trying to deny it but they're they're really just determinists no we're not so I, I hope that point comes out loud and clear so we can move the discussion forward and stop straw manning us as compatibilists as nothing but determinists, which I hear over and over and over again. So if we could please stop that. Um, if, if, if I'm wrong, you know, argue against it. But um, So John C. Wingard Jr., I'll put this article in the show notes. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Apologetics from the Attic. Uh, join us, like, share, subscribe. God bless.